Thank you, everybody, for joining this webinar. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you, wherever you are listening and watching. My name is Harold Bornfried, and I am responsible for the BISA product portfolio. Today, I'm joined by my colleagues, Mateusz Ruziniak and Avinash Pant, who are with me here at BISA headquarters, and will pick up all your contributions to the discussion. And we will try and answer them at the end of the session. So today I'm going to speak about the latest features in the BISA research software. As you maybe know, we released version 7.0 this year with a whole new set of features enabling cutting edge processing pipelines for your research tasks. In the coming hour, I would like to walk you through the major new features of this new release of BISA research. The schedule for today looks like this. So first of all, I will give you a short introduction to the main new features, which comprise a brand new connectivity module, time domain beamformers, brain atlases, Bayesian source imaging, and processing of simultaneous fMRI EEG recordings. We will then look at these features hands-on, and after that, there will be time to answer some questions. So please, throughout the presentation, feel free to send in your questions. You can send them in by using the panel that should be up on your screen, either using the questions or the chat panel. And yeah, my colleagues will pick them up and then we'll answer them together after the demonstration part. So let's just have a quick look at the features of the connectivity analysis that are now available. We offer a new standalone program with 64-bit architecture and a modern workflow design. We can analyze connectivity in sensor space or in source space. And the module contains the last connectivity methods like Granger causality, partial direct coherence, and many more. Of course, we do have state-of-the-art visualization and data export, and we also offer video generation tools. The time domain beamformer actually it contains a number of different beamformer types. You can browse through the beamformer maxima and you can create virtual sensor montages at any point of interest. With these, you can then reconstruct the time courses of activation at these locations. Or you can choose the beamformer mode where the whole beamformer image is recomputed for any time point, which is based on an approach by Sekihara. The relevant beamformer intervals are selected in the ERP module using the butterfly plot of sensor activity. The brain atlases which are now available also give you several options. First of all, you can select from several atlases like AAL, Brainatome, Broadman and others. Then there are also different ways of visualizing them from a full-blown coloring via a joint visualization of source images with transparent atlas up to a contour line mode that does not interfere with the source image display. Then another exciting new agreement is the Bayesian source imaging, namely the sequential semi-analytic Monte Carlo estimation, or in short, SESAMI. This is a real button press localization method that automatically finds the most likely number of sources and computes the map of likelihood for the source positions. The sampling of the posterior probability distribution uses Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for an efficient computation of this distribution. And last but not least, we will try out processing of joint EEG fMRI recordings. Of course, these recordings suffer from severe artifacts, but these can now be corrected with few mouse clicks in BISA, and BISA lets you choose between three different published and verified methods. Once you have processed the EEG data, you can also read the fMRI data directly into BISA research. You can see sources and see the activation in the EEG on a millisecond scale. The BISA wiki answers many questions and gives practical hints on many topics of EEG and MEG analysis, so please visit us there. And now I would like to show you a bit more hands-on what these new features look like. So let's start with the connectivity. The connectivity basically covers five steps to take you from raw data to the final result. So the first step is to load the raw data. 
Then you need to select the source montage or the sensor montage of interest that you want to analyze. Then define the paradigm. Then select the condition to analyze. There's a few automated steps that the processing pipeline goes through. Then you compute the time frequency transforms and using them finally continue with the connectivity workflow to get to the connectivity. So I have a data set that I always wanted to analyze in more detail. This is an error related negativity data file, which was recorded in a 128 channel recording. We had a visual stimulus and a task. The task was either pressing the left or the right mouse button, depending what was displayed. And that needed to be happening fast. This data here is already epoched and sorted according to correct and error trials. This is why you have these jumps, since uh, these are different epochs. And if I now look at the connectivity between 128 channels on the scalp, I will find a huge amount of connectivity. But the real effects will be masked by volume conduction effects. So I will first transform the signal into the brain using a brain source montage. This montage here, ERN, has 11 sources. To see where in the brain they are, I can use the Edit Montage button here, EDM, to bring up the display of that montage. And let me just re-change this display to four different slices. I can now look through these different channels here. The first channel models prim primary visual activity. The next two channels model the lateralized visual areas, VIL, VIR. Then I have two sources in the basal aspects of the temporal lobes, left and right. Also, two motor cortex sources and one for the anterior cingulate cortex as well as for the posterior cingulate. Finally, the last two sources are actually outside of the brain and they model eye field activity that we're not really interested in. So with this source montage, I will analyze connectivity between these regions. The ERP button allows me to look at the conditions. I have a condition with a stimulus as a trigger event followed by an error response with 201 sweeps and I have a condition with a stimulus followed by correct response with 307. If I look at artifacts, I can exclude some sweeps from further analysis using the slider. And this still leaves me enough to keep processing with my connectivity analysis. So now to the fourth step, calculating the time frequency transform. So I select the condition I want to analyze. I can actually select two. So I'll choose the stimulus followed by error and stimulus followed by correct, and then simply start connectivity. And now BISA exports the data and starts this BISA connectivity program. You can see it appearing here at the bottom. So let me just bring it up. And now it plunges straight into the time frequency workflow. So I will first select the method I want to apply. That is the wavelet using Morley. And the number of conditions and the names are already pre-populated. So I can just press the next. And next again to load the data that I've exported from Visa Research. I can see that this name is pre-populated. So that was passed from Visa Research. And I can press next again and load the other data file. Now I can see the overview here. I've got 11 source channels, different numbers of trials, and the rest of the parameters are the same. So next now gives me the overview. And I now have the chance to look at each individual trial. And I could now throw out more 
error trials if I wanted to, if there was an artifact, but I've already excluded artifacts, so that is not necessary. I can then look at the frequency range I want to analyze, and I'll set the number of oscillations for the model to four. Then I'll proceed and now run the time frequency analysis. This is very fast. So here is the result as a so-called temporal spectral evolution plot. This is the same as event-related synchronization or desynchronization. You can see that the desynchronization happens in the visual primary channel here where the blue is visible. If I look at the lateralized visual, I can see a power rise at a low frequency and another desynchronization at about 12 hertz here. And then I have the singulate sources. Here I have a very strong power increase at lower frequency ranges. This is the error condition. And how about the other condition, the correct answers? I just click here to switch conditions. And I can see that compared to the error condition, there's very little singular activity visible here. I could now export these results using the export menu, or I can finish the workflow and continue with connectivity, which is what I'll do. So finish, save it. I'll call it ERN SRC to condition, condition, to conditions. And that brings me back to the start screen and now I can start the connectivity analysis. So which connectivity methods will I apply? I will choose coherence, imaginary part of coherency and Granger. Next, then select the time frequency decomposition. That is already pre-selected by the one I saved just now. And I get the summary again, and I can see my time frequency decomposition once more. Plus I can make some more adjustments for Granger if I feel like it. I just press next and run the analysis. This now, computes the connectivity for three different methods in two different conditions. So naturally, this takes a little time. You can see how the progress bar advances through the different calculations. Most time is actually taken up by calculating the transfer matrix of the wavelet transform in order to compute the Granger causality. So bear with me um, another few seconds and we'll then get to the final display. Here we are. So this is the 2D plot of coherence of all channels by all channels. I'll scale this, I'll zoom this a little bit. So we can see that there's a lot of coherence happening here. And I'll just quickly change the method to imaginary part of coherency. And now I've got much less to worry about. Scale this up a bit to 1.5. And I'll hide the diagonal since that is just the self spectrum, not the connectivity between two channels. So I can see, for example, a lot of connectivity happening between the primary visual area and the right lateralized visual area. And also, I can see quite a lot happening between right visual and motor cortex on the right hand side. So let's have a look at this in 3D. I just click on some value here to set the frequency and latency and I can then show the 3D mode and look at the connectivity like this. So this shows all the connectivities at this particular latency and frequency. However, I need to uh, set a threshold, so I'll only see what's above the threshold. If I set this down to 0.3, I can see that this main connectivity at this particular frequency 
happens in the posterior part of the brain. So we have the visual areas connecting with each other, with the temporal lobe and with the motor cortex. Right, this was at about nine hertz here. How about the lower frequencies? Let me go back to the 2D display and have a look at the singulate. So let me choose this singulate posterior plot. And so now here you can see this large connectivity happening at low frequencies and just have a look at the 3D mode for this. So now I can see a totally different connectivity map. You can see very well how the cingulate is connected to the uh, associated visual areas and also the temporal lobe. And again, this was for the error response. So what about the correct response? Let me just check this out. Just check this here. So now I've got virtually nothing happening here. So there's a huge difference in the networks at this frequency between these two. But maybe I just got the wrong time. So if I want to check on that, I can simply average over the time here. So let's say we want to look at a time window of about 200 to 500 milliseconds after the stimulus. So I can see how the connectivity changes if I adjust the time. And there is a peak happening, for, at least for the posterior cingulate, around about, um, yeah, five hertz, six hertz. Right, uh, I could now lower the threshold and I see something happening, but it's much, much lower in activation than what I saw in the error condition. So one more time, let's go back to the 2D because I want to have a look at the Granger now. And simply change this to Granger. And I also want to get rid of my averaging. So I'm going to look at the whole range again. And Granger is usually a lot weaker. I need to scale this up quite a lot in order to see something happening. But then I can see there's something actually appearing at, uh, again, between the right visual areas and the motor cortex, right? Uh, at around 15 hertz. And let's just have another look at the 3D plot for this one. I need to lower the threshold a bit more. And then I can see that there is a Granger causality happening here. I can also scale up the connections and the direction of the cone here informs you about the direction of information transfer. So we can see that it happens from the visual area to the motor cortex in this case. And I can also now look at the temporal evolution of that connectivity. If I want to create a video for this, I simply go to export video. I choose all windows because I want to look at the 3D and also the 2D detail windows here at the bottom. And then I have my dialogue here where I can make some adjustments. So let's say I want to create a video of what's happening between 60 hertz, uh, 60 milliseconds roughly, and say 470. And my duration per latency step for the video would just be 0.1. I can also rotate the brain during that to and fro, and I can change the background color. Let's say I want to have a black background, and I can start recording. And now this will go through and look at all the connectivities over time that happen at that particular frequency. And the video can later on be saved and can be used for demonstration purposes, for example. Of course, this takes a little time to compute, but uh, we can see how different connections um, appear and disappear again. Of course, now my threshold has been lowered to the minimum, so it's quite sensitive here. And when that video has been pre-computed, I can then save it and I should be able to play it afterwards too. So let's save it here. I'll just call it range. 
and let me just try and bring up this video. And this is what it looks like when it plays after it's been computed. So this was a very brief introduction into the connectivity module. So uh, I think it's very versatile. Again, we can also export all these results here. Let me just finish this workflow now to not forget about the results and then I'll close this module and we move on to the next exciting feature. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is time domain beamformers. So we're going to use a different example now. This is a auditory recording and it happened with five different intensities. So uh, I'm gonna look at the ERP conditions again. They were predefined. So I can see there's various intensities from 60 to 100 decibels and there's a condition called low. For the low intensities, I can now go to the average tab and select this low condition and then use this beamformer button to bring up the settings dialog for the beamformer calculation. So I can adjust three intervals. One is for the baseline, uh, which is used for noise covariance matrix calculation. One is for the signal covariance matrix. And then we also have a common interval that should summarize the whole time area of activity. So first of all, I press the butterfly plot to get the butterfly plot of all channels. And now I can adjust these intervals. If I wanted to change the baseline to 100, minus 120 to minus 10, then I can see how it adjusts at the bottom here. I can change it back. Uh, the only thing that should be noted here is that the signal interval should have a similar duration as the baseline interval such that we have a matched number of samples in these covariance matrix calculations. Um, so I'll just stick with these values and press OK. And then the covariance matrices are calculated. The source analysis module starts and I can see the beamformer result. I just need to scale this up a little bit. And I get information about how many maxima were found here just enlarge this whole window like this. And so I can see basically that this beamformer has done a pretty good job because I wanted to, well, I suspect that my main activity will be in the Heschel gyrus since this is an auditory stimulation. And I can see the first maximum is already very close to the auditory area here. And if I browse through the maxima using the M button, can go to the next and the next, and then I get to the contralateral side, and again, my beam for maximum homes in quite closely to the actual area. So that's quite nice. Um, I just want to have a look at the beamformer settings now. So let me make this smaller and go to this arrow from which I can access the settings directly. So here I have my beamformer settings dialog. I can see that BISA by default uses a multiple source beamformer. And this is the reason why we were able to separate these two highly correlated auditory activities very well. Um, so the multiple source beamformer will scan bilateral areas simultaneously and uh, that enables it to pick up these Correlated activities. Let me adjust, adjust one option now. So I'm going to use the common weights for the beamformer image calculation. And then I can apply this setting and also press the go button again to run the beamformer. And now I can see the result here. And if I go back to the maximum and scale a bit more, you can see that actually now it's got a lot more focal and it's also got even closer to the auditory areas. So um, the first two maxima are now the, uh, both bilateral maxima uh, around the auditory regions. So I can now go, let me go back to the first maximum, now go and also 
insert virtual sensors uh, using these results. So if I use this tool button to insert a source, you can see this symbol appearing for virtual beamformer sensor. Go to the next maximum and do the same thing here. And then I can reconstruct the time courses for these virtual sensors. Uh, I can see them here appearing around the times where the auditory main activation happens. Um, I could even now create source montages using these uh, sensors, just like with any other source model in PISA research. So um, yeah, I think that's a nice addition to the source montage and tools we had also in the past. And um, if I now want to find out which brain region does my uh, source end up in, I can use the Atlas functionality here. So I just need to click on this icon to toggle the Brain Atlas overlay and enlarge this. And I have several options to change Atlas options. So the default is the Brain Atom Atlas. And let me just go back to the first source. And then we can see that wherever the brain is sliced, I can see the information about the anatomy down here at the right. I can right click and change first of all the blending mode to the coloring. And I can right click again to the options to change the atlas that's used. So the default, yeah, when you start pizza for the first time as a brain tone, let me switch to AAL now and apply this. And now I can see that I have a different uh, atlas here in my um, annotation. And uh, as expected, my, my activity from the auditory uh, activation lands in the temporal superior gyrus in this case. So that is uh, also good information. And of course, uh, there's a challenge now with the visualization that we have and on the one hand the source image that we're showing in this brain and on the other hand we have the atlas overlay so we could change the opacity here we can for example put it down to 25 percent apply this and now we have a kind of much better balanced visualization between source image and atlas so that can be played around with and as, a, so as we already saw before, we can also change the whole visualization mode to either just labels, which will not show anything else in the brain, or we could go to the contour mode where we see the contours of all the different atlas regions, and then we can try and figure out, uh, so how far does this region actually stretch from the area where my source activation is. Okay, so, that was a brief excursion to the Atlas. So another thing that we added to the source analysis a toolbox is Bayesian source imaging. So what is Bayesian source imaging? Let me just close this for a sec. Um, the idea is that we want to find the most likely source configuration that explains the data. So as the input, we use our data and we use a prior probability distribution for the numbers of sources for the locations of the sources and the dipole moments of sources, where the numbers are usually a Poisson distribution, locations are a uniform distribution, and the dipole moments could be Gaussian distribution. And using these priors, we then sample the posterior distribution, and we use Bayes' theorem to figure out the likelihood for different values of three, these three parameters, given the observed data. So that's the theory. In practice, we have an issue there and this is about sampling of this posterior distribution because it takes a long time. And uh, here the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling comes in handy. So we're going to look at the same data just averaged over several subjects. So let me go and open the average. So now we can see different segments for different strengths of, um, of the tone that was uh, presented to the subjects. Uh, it's an average over 10 subjects. And again, we're going to work with a low intensity and start source analysis using, uh, let me just adjust this a little bit. So I'm going to use minus 100 to 250 milliseconds and filters between 0.5 and 40 hertz 
for an optimal pre-filtering of the data, then start the source analysis. And I can see here the global field power with a peak around 44, 50 milliseconds for the P50, then rising to the main peak at 100 milliseconds for the N100. So my goal is now to localize this N100 using an automated procedure. And I'll simply mark this main block of activation from around 70 to 130 milliseconds and press the sesame button. So this starts the sesame calculation now, and it will go through many iterations to sample this posterior with different priors. I'll just adjust this a little bit so we can see better what's happening. So after each iteration, we get an update of the probability map for the most likely solution. And we can see that at the beginning, uh, we have the maximum of sources. So we have 10 different maxima that are currently estimated. And we'll see if Sesame manages to home in on a more likely solution over time. And we can already see that the number of maxima are now reduced. And finally, we should end up with just ideally two. We don't see the individual brain now because this is a grand average over 10 subjects. So we're working with the average brain here, just uh, gives us an idea of the main uh, contour outlines of the main structures of the brain. So we can still identify where we are in the brain anatomy. So now Sesame is almost complete. And indeed, at the end, yeah, we end up with two maxima and we auto slice the brain at the first one. Again, we've done quite well. It's a little bit frontal, but uh, generally in the area of the auditory and the other sources even closer to the auditory area. So this is a complete button press result without any further uh, constraints on fitting that we would have had to apply with dipole fitting here to get to the auditory result. And yeah, there is uh, oh, yeah. So what I can do now is that I can, again, seed sources from this. So let me insert a source here and insert a source at the second maximum. And now I can look at the temporal evolution of these sources. And I can also orient these regional sources uh, in a better way. I can turn around these three orientations. And then I will see that my two sources very nicely dissociate the N100 and the N150, which comes up a little bit later and has a different orientation, but is in the same general area. So yeah, this is a kind of one way how we can combine this imaging myth with uh, dipole modeling too. And I'll just go back to the data now and have a look at another condition in the same experiment where a high intensity tone was applied. So I can drag over this other segment here with the high intensity, right click, and um, I can see at the bottom of this pop-up menu, these are the settings I applied for the low intensity, and I'm just gonna apply the same settings, uh, add that to source analysis, and just clear the solution just to make a clean slate, and then run the sesame again on this particular data set. So I'm just going to use the same fitting interval and press sesame. And now it's going to work with a high intensity condition. So yeah, uh, it's quite a computation intensive time. Uh, so it will take a few seconds to get there. And we can see again that it starts with a wide distribution of potential source locations, which then will gradually converge to something that is uh, more physiologically meaningful. So we're already kind of halfway through the estimation. And now we can see that there is another source that becomes prominent that we did not see in the low intensity case, which is quite central and in the frontal part of the brain. And this is something that we also 
found out with very careful dipole modeling of this data set uh, using first uh, the low intensity and then adding stuff for the high intensity. Then we could also figure out, yes, uh, there is some activity in the anterior cingulate that we did not uh, see in the low condition. And with, the, with this method, we don't need to make any prior assumptions. We just run it and we see what it comes out with. So <clears throat> that is um, the power of this method. And we'll, uh, it's brand new, so we don't have uh, many uh, publications out about it yet. And we're just kind of by ourselves also evaluating it further. And we are looking forward to um, sort of the feedback from the field too. So yeah, it just takes a little bit longer, but we can see quite nicely that it uh, seems to home in on this anterior cortex and also uh, seems to keep the sources that we saw in the auditory lateral lateralized areas too. Yeah, we'll take another few seconds here, I think. On the left side here, we can also see the uh, butterfly plot of the signal and the main PCA components. So in this interval that I've selected, there is uh, one main PCA component and then another one that's quite a lot less strong. And that shows you that there's a lot of correlated activity going on in this particular time window. So that makes it hard to figure this out in conventional dipole modeling. Okay, so now it's converged to the final result and we can see this, uh, as I mentioned, this anterior cortex, anterior cingulate is active here. And again, we have the lateralized areas. This is close to the auditory or insular region. And this is uh, close to the auditory on the uh, other side. So the locations are not super precise, but the um, activity will be recovered very well using this if I now introduce sources and also um, I get a very good idea about how many sources I do expect and roughly where they are located. This was uh, Sesame and now we're getting to the last but not least topic of new features in BISA Research 7 and this is using simultaneous EEG fMRI recordings in BISA. So one thing I need to mention here, uh, there's an important hint for acquisition of simultaneous EEG and fMRI. And that is uh, you need to make sure that e your EEG hardware is clock synchronized with the MRI scanner. Uh, clock synchronization is available for almost every EEG vendor. So please ask your supplier for details. BISA Research will also check if triggers are properly synced, and if a problem is detected, then fMRI artifact correction will not be possible. And please note that uh, the fMRI volume triggers that are generated by the MRI machine, they need to be present in the EEG file. So in this file here, I can see uh, different trigger values here at the bottom. So in this case, that has happened. And of course, I can also see this a huge artifact that's generated by the volume scanner and that masks the actual brain activity that I'm interested in. And this recording here was a resting state uh, EG fMRI recording and we superimposed some uh, simulated auditory data on that too just for demonstration purposes. So let me try and artifact correct this now. I go to the artifact menu and there's a new entry now fMRI artifact which brings up a dialog. And that dialog shows me different options. So first of all, there's the length of fMRI volume. So this is, uh, I know the trigger spacing between the two different triggers, but sometimes the length of acquisition is less than the spacing between the triggers. So in this case, I need to adjust this. 
Uh, there may be a delay between the marker and the start of volume acquisition. And uh, there's a trigger code that I use for this volume acquisition. And here on the left, I have the number of artifact occurrence averages. So if I choose 16, that means that I'm going to work with eight preceding and eight subsequent fMRI gradient artifacts for each current volume that I want to correct. I can also skip some scans in case there's early trigger events that are not actually uh, coinciding with the volume acquisition. And then I have the option to apply a movement threshold correction or rejection. So if I want to do this, I need a realignment file. The realignment file can be created using uh, different methods, for example, SPM, Brain Voyager, FSL, AFNI. So I'm just going to browse for this one. Here is one that we created. And now I can adjust this movement threshold. Let me just put it to 0 0.28. And I can now choose any of these four and uh, three different methods for correction of this fMRI artifact. So the Mooseman and others is the most advanced and the most recent. I'm going to try this one and then I can see the template creation matrix. So that means which scans surrounding a current volume will be used to estimate the artifact. And uh, of course, then correct for this artifact. You can see that usually uh, it's the eight preceding and eight subsequent scans. But in the case of a motion artifact, like here, uh, instead of using this balanced one, um, the uh, method will then choose preceding ones rather than posts, posterior ones because it will give a better accurate estimate of the actual artifact. If I choose the uh, standard Allen one, then the Volumes will all be similar, but uh, for Mooseman, we have a different process of uh, creating them. So now I can apply this, and then I can see that the artifact indeed is corrected, and I see the underlying activity. I just now need to go and also apply a notch filter to get rid of the main frequency. And what I'm left with now is still the ballistocardiographic artifact. So this is due to the blood flow inside the magnet. You can see these recurring artifacts here. Uh, the blood contains charged particles, which again create an artifact in the magnetic field. But this artifact can be dealt with using standard visa artifact correction. We can simply average over multiple occurrences of this and uh, then apply our artifact correction toolbox. I think we're running out of time a little bit, so I'll skip demonstration of this, but uh, there's a detailed YouTube video about this that uh, shows these steps. So uh, please visit our YouTube channel and that will be shown. Now, good, so we have corrected, we could average our uh, activity of interest now. So let me just open a predefined average that was obtained here and also apply the notch filter. And now I can use this in the source analysis module and also use the fMRI that was recorded together with this EEG data. So let me just use this particular segment. It's maybe a bit too much. Minus 200 to 300, say, and send it to source analysis. And in my source analysis module, I now have the option of loading in the original recording of the fMRI data. So I just press the A key to bring up the anatomy. I think I don't have the registration anymore. So I just need to show you on the average brain. This also works if you have a co-registered brain available. And I'll just go, actually, I think I do have it. Let me just bring it up real quick. I just need to browse for the file. This should be the co-registration file. And bring it up again. So here we are. This is the co-registered brain. And I now can go to image and import this fMRI. 
it needs to be in either Brain Voyager format as Nifty or an ASCII file. In this case, it was an Analyze Nifty file, um, which I can open. And it should then show me the data as it's loaded, plus some options of thresholding. So first of all, I don't want negative values. I now enter the degrees of freedom, which there was 60 volumes, so degrees of freedom in this case is 59. And then I can adjust the statistical threshold that I want to show from. So I want to do anything above 0 0.01, and that automatically adjusts the voxel value threshold. Just press OK. And now I've got my processed fMRI here. And now, of course, again, I can seed sources or I can use that image to um, to try and provide a weighting, an image weighting for any source fitting. So if I seed source from this maximum and the second most highest maximum, then I can see my sources appearing and I could convert them to dipoles here as well to fit their orientation. And then I can see how the uh, activity in a, on a millisecond scale uh, applies during this fMRI acquisition. So I think it's a very powerful combination of the, um, the where and the when, the fMRI for where and the EEG signal for the millisecond exact activation. And this brings me to the end of this hands-on presentation. So I hope these examples showed some useful applications of the new features. And we do also have a lot of other improvements in this release that I did not have time to go through, but they are listed in the update history on the download section of our website.